Someone said to me, uh, Sister Joy said she was looking for me and she couldn't find me because I'm invisible on social media. All you see is barrel landers. <laughs> I'm just an appendage, you know. Yeah, the, uh, the silent other half is not that important. I'm even more nervous because she's here and I wasn't expecting her to be here. <laughs> and she's always telling me, you look so angry when you preach. Friends, I'm never angry when I preach. But I believe that Jesus is coming soon. That's why my number plate is J-I-C-A-V-S. J-I-C-A-V-S. Work it out. What it is, what it means. Jesus is coming again very soon. And friends, brothers and sisters, when will we be the people that God is looking for? When will we be devoted? When will we be passionate about getting out to the world? Because God has blessed us with a message like no other church. It's not there to give us, uh, 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 what do they call it? Click numbers, you know, on YouTube. If you get 20 million, the more million you get, the more money you get. No, it's not there for that. It's to bless us with the knowledge with the sure certainty that he's coming again. And so we should know that it's time for us to rise up and share this message with the world. And so, friends, please don't think that I'm coming here to throw stones. I don't know this church. I don't know most of the people in this church. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what you're experiencing. I don't know where you are on your walk with God. So I'm preaching to myself today. And if a few sir, uh, stones hit you, well, that be it. So be it. And I'm not here on a vendetta, hoping to hit somebody. This title... The title was what I was praying for because when Pastor Neustraten invited me to come to Waitara, I had been thinking I was only good enough for a mountain in the city. You know, I'd been preaching there a lot and never invited to Waitara, but now he's invited me. So uh, maybe I'm good enough for Waitara too. But I was asking God for a message, and this is the message God has given me. I've never preached here, and I've never preached on this chapter. And I've never preached about this topic. Blocking the rain. Blocking the rain. While I was putting this onto paper, Last night, I was sitting in front of the window, and the rain was bucketing down. It, the, the lightning was booming, and uh, the, the flashes were going off uh, virtually every couple of seconds. And I thought to myself, isn't this a bit perhaps silly or innocuous to suggest that you can block the rain? I mean, we've all witnessed the impossibility of blocking the physical rain because we've experienced uh, secondhand, most of us, but maybe some people have experienced the floods, how quickly they rise because of the rain that is falling more and more. Doesn't the scripture say that the end will come with a flood? I always thought that was meaning that everything is going to happen all at once. But it seems that it's coming with a physical flood too. And my title, of course, is not about blocking the physical rain. I'm not talking about something physical, but spiritual. I'm hoping to expose or examine the core problem in God's church today. 
And of course, I'm sure that by now most of you realize that what I'm talking about is the reason why God's church seems so powerless. Why are we not seeing thousands being baptized in a day? Like in the apostolic church. Why are we not seeing the raising of the physically lame miracles of healing? And why do our lives seem so humdrum and mundane? A carbon copy of yesterday and exactly like the next day. Why does sin seem to be flourishing and evil seems to be winning and death seems to be burgeoning and we seem to be withering? Why has Jesus not come and we are not overcoming and the evil one is not burning and we have not been glorified? Yes, I'm talking about what is desperately needed for Jesus to come I'm talking about the spiritual reign, the latter reign. And the question, what is blocking the reign? Have we got any idea? By God's grace, I hope that at the end of this message, we will agree on the main reason why we would have identified the main reason why we have this delay, the reason why we are where we are. Before we start, let's invite the Holy Spirit to open our hearts and our minds. Dear loving Heavenly Father, O oh God of mercy and grace, commander of the universe, please hide me behind the cross of Jesus the reason why Jesus came, hide me behind that cross today. May it not be my words, may people not hear my voice, but may they hear your words and your voice speaking today. Oh Lord, open our hearts and our minds as we open this message, as we look at this passage from your word. And Father, may the Holy Spirit Open our understanding so that we can apply this message to our lives and look at why the rain seems to be blocked because we know you are waiting to pour out the rain on each one of us. Thank you, Father, for everything that will be done in this opening of your word is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I would like to come back to our scripture today and thank you to Hannah for reading. And let's read together from the scriptures, John chapter 17, from verse 11 to 21. I struggled to, uh, to decide where I was going to uh, choose a passage because when you look at the whole chapter, you see that this is Jesus' prayer for the world before he left. John chapter 17 from verse 11, I'm reading from the King James Version. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name, those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And then verse 13 says, And now I come to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have joy, for my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them. Life is not going to get any easier. Because when we go out to share the word, the world is not going to love us for doing it. Jesus tells us this. Because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. 
I pray not that thou shouldest taken them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. Then again, Jesus repeats, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. Isn't it very significant what this passage is talking about? First of all, let's notice that it's Jesus talking here. This is what Jesus is, uh, is, is, is almost, he's laying out a, a, a prototype or a, 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 a dying wish for his church. And he repeats it over and over to emphasize that. The second thing, of course, is that this is his last message. So it carries extra weight. It carries extra significance, extra importance. And merits special attention. I'm sure that if you knew that if a few hours you were going to die and you are surrounded by your family and special friends, you would leave them with what is close to your heart. You're not going to be making silly jokes about how Johnny's still uh, doing silly things and, and how this one or that one. Or You are going to open to them the deepest, innermost longings of your heart, of your mind, something that you may not have told them before. And... In this chapter, we see revealed by Jesus what he was longing, what he was wishing, what he was putting out as an example for his church to follow. And the most significant thing is what he repeats over and over. Spend time going over this passage and it is clear that Christ is praying for three things. Sorry, I don't know if my face is lighting up like a turkey, but I'm not angry. It's just I'm getting a bit, you know, when you, when you uh, are nervous, your sympathetic nervous system is in overdrive. And uh, it makes you red, look like a bit of a turkey. My wife always tells me that. <laughs> I've been blessed by having such a blessed wife. She looks after me all the time. She's my biggest critic, but that's good. Cuts you down to size of it, you know. You know what we blokes are like. You get a bit big-headed sometimes. Oh, sorry, nobody's laughing. None of the blokes are laughing. <laughs> they don't agree with me, but it's the truth. But Christ is praying for three things. He's praying for protection. That's what he says. He says... <laughs> Pardon me. Um, I pray not in verse 15 that thou should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from evil. So that's protection. The second thing he's praying for is praying for sanctification. Verse 17, we all know it. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. You see, when you see what is in the media... I'm talking not about what is in the media outside. I'm talking about what's in the media inside. And when people are trying to tell you that righteousness by faith does not include sanctification, then you should quote this verse. Because if this is what Jesus says, then who do you think you are? Because you got a PhD, you can override what Jesus says? Hang on. Jesus is talking. God is talking to us. Jesus is God. He is telling us that he is seeking that we should be sanctified. 
In other words, we should be set apart from the world. That we should be not of the world. We may be in the world, but not of the world. You see, we've got a different culture. We've got a different way of doing things. We've got a different way of understanding things because God has separated us from the world so that we can be like Jesus. Why do we want to be wannabes? You know what I'm saying? Why do we want to look like the world? Why do we want to dress like the world? Why do we want to listen to their music, watch their movies, talk like they talk? Is it so that we can fit in with them? Or do we want to follow what Jesus says? That we must be set aside for a special purpose. Now, I'm not saying that you must go and shut yourself up in some cabin somewhere on a mountain for the next couple of years. Notice I'm saying the next couple of years. That's not what God is looking for. We have a sacred mission, and God is looking for his people to fulfill that mission. But certainly not if we look just like everybody else. If we talk like everybody else, if we swear like everybody swears, and we listen to all that evil music which is straight from the devil because he knows he can manipulate our minds through music. If you look into the physiology if you look into the neurochemistry of music, the devil is using music to get into your mind. <coughs> Pardon me. And sanctification is important, yes. But I want to put it to you that the overarching desire that is coming out in this passage is unity. 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 Because the phrase, they may be one, only appears in the Bible in this passage. It's nowhere else in the Bible. And what Jesus is seeking for here, and this is a very important question that I cannot be diverted by. You see, I'm not going to be talking about what is unity, because that could take uh, a couple of sermons, and, and, and I don't have all that time. I'm very aware of time, and I see it's already 10 past, 8 minutes past 12. And I was given 35 minutes, so I'm running out of time. I'm only about page 3. <laughs> um, but uh, I'll try and talk a bit faster. Maybe you won't understand me because I've got a funny accent. <laughs> I'm already worried about uh, the light. You know, I know there's a lot of glare here because it shines a lot. And uh, I'm a bit concerned that you may have to get your sunglasses soon. <laughs> but the important thing is that God is looking for unity in his church. In fact, he says that more than once because it's the most important thing for the church to display. Notice what he says. that they all, I'm reading verse 21, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. And then comes the most important part of that verse, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. You know, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I, I've read this verse many times, I'm sure. You've read it many times. But just, just let it sink in for a little bit. Jesus is looking for unity so that there will be consequences. Something is going to follow when the world sees that we have a unity that the world doesn't have. There are going to be consequences when the world sees that we have a unity of mind. Notice what Jesus is saying here that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee. You see, I don't think that up in heaven, God and Jesus are sitting at the table and they're disagreeing about how to keep the Sabbath. And friends...
God says, this is my holy day. And we know what that word holy is. I'm not here to give you a lesson in Greek or Hebrew. I'm not a, a scholar myself. I'm a doctor, yes, but not a scholar of Greek or Hebrew. But you can look it up for yourself. That day was set apart at the creation of the world for a reason. Because during that day, it's time for us to unload ourselves of the world and worldliness and enter into God's rest so that God can talk to us. It's not time for us to have a feast so that our minds are clouded because you know what happens when you have a feast. The blood goes from your brain and goes to your stomach. I'm talking plain physiology and anatomy here, guys. It goes to your stomach. That's why you get so sleepy when you've had too much to eat. Because the blood is not reaching your brain. It is blood. There's still blood going to your brain, obviously. Otherwise, you'd be dead in five minutes. <laughs> but it's all going to your stomach. That's why it is good to fast. Because your mind is clearer. Your mind can think more clearly. You can appreciate more Clean, keenly, what Jesus does for you every day, every second, every minute. God is keeping you alive every second of your life. There's something on your heart called the SA note. You can look it up. Don't believe me. That's, that's, that's. When I have a Bible study, I always tell the people, don't believe me. Read the Bible for yourself. Doesn't the scripture say so? Study to show thyself approved. Doesn't matter what the minister or the pastor or the general conference leaders say, it matters what the Bible says. That's why we must study the Bible for ourselves. And I don't believe my colleagues, even specialists, professors, when they talk to me and they say something that I'm not sure of, I don't just say, Oh, no, the professor said, so it must be true. No, I go and research it for myself. And that's what we should all do. <coughs> Pardon me. But God is looking for us to separate ourselves, and the Sabbath is his holy day, and we should be keeping the Sabbath holy. And that's why... We need to have unity of mind, soul, and purpose. Now, we're not one in superficial ways. We don't all look alike, fortunately. I mean, imagine how boring the world would be if everybody looked the same. God is a God of diversity. He's got 300 million kinds of beetles. I mean, just think of that genius that can create 300 million different kinds of beetles. Why do we see all the different colors? Because God is a God of genius. He makes the colors so that we can appreciate them. But God and Jesus are not fighting over or nitpicking over things because they are one. And for us to present a united face, a united voice to the world, we need to put aside our minimalities. There's no such word, I don't think, but forgive me. <laughs> you know what I mean. The, 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 the trivialities that we sometimes spend hours talking about. Apparently, uh, some board meetings, people talk for two hours about the color of the carpet. <laughs> Hello. That's going to take you to heaven, sure. <laughs> the point is, brothers and sisters, we need to put aside those minimal things and be united in mind. We need to agree on the important things. And when somebody knows better than you, don't get upset. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Why are you getting upset because somebody knows better than you? That aside, we are one. We are united in mind. We are united in soul. In other words, we are united spiritually. I often cringe when I hear 
believers talking about the next 50 years. Yeah. 50 years. Yeah, I've got friends who talk about the next 50 or 60 years. I don't know what planet they're on. But I know there's not going to be 50 or 60 years. Yeah, I know Jesus never told us when it's going to come. But all the more reason why we should listen to what he says in Matthew 24, verse 44. Therefore, repeat it to me, fill it in for me. Be ye ready. Jesus doesn't say get ready. No, 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 no. You see, if you're waiting to get ready, if you're waiting for the National Sunday laws to get ready, if you're waiting for some encyclical to come out and to say, if you don't go to, to church on Sunday, you're going to be in jail, you may not be ready when it comes. Because none of us know, none of us can guarantee that we're going to be here tomorrow. It doesn't, it doesn't matter how young you are. <laughs> You know, when I was younger, I, was, I thought I was bulletproof until I got back pain. I remember, I can still remember, that was 1985. I walked out of the, the orthopedic specialist room and I felt like I was 65 years old. Because he said to me, you shouldn't cycle, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that because I had sciatica. And I thought to myself, wow, I, I, I felt old. But we cannot guarantee that we're going to be here tomorrow because, friends, God knows when our time is up. And I'm not wishing evil upon anybody, please. Don't, no, pastor's here, he can hear what I'm saying. So don't go to him afterwards and say, don't, don't send that guy again. He's, he's talking death here. We don't want to hear it. The point is, brothers and sisters, Jesus says we must be ready because it could be tomorrow. And if we're not ready, we're not going to go through probation. We're not going to go through the time of trouble such as never was. We're not going to be deceived by the devil when he comes as an angel of light. We are going to be sleeping. And when Jesus comes, if we're not ready, when Jesus comes, and calls us out of the grave. Will we hear his voice? Because we were not ready when our time was up. You see, brothers and sisters, I've got to come to an end. Uh, I'm, 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 uh, I'm convicted. There's something that's blocking that unity. Something is blocking the latter rain, and I, I, I don't know what's happening in your church. I can't see all the things that you are doing. But I want to put it to you that that one thing that's blocking the latter rain is pride. And I say that for a reason, because pride, I believe, is the first of all sin. I want you to notice what's, what's in the middle of the word pride. I. And when you read Isaiah chapter 14, what does it say about the devil? I will be like the most high. And that was the very first sin that came into the universe. It was the sin of pride. And everything else follows from that. Although the Bible doesn't talk about the seven deadly sins. I want to just share with you what uh, I believe the Lord is, uh, has given me. The seven deadly sins you know, lust, envy, greed, gluttony, anger, sloth, and of course pride. Envy is pride aroused. Anger is pride enraged. Greed is pride engaged. Sloth is pride concealed. Gluttony is pride indulged. And lust is pride titillated. It all comes from pride. You're rude to somebody? Because you're arrogant. Where does your arrogance come from? Because you're too proud. And for us to be the people that are united, there's a quote that I read in preparation for this message, 
Pride is the greatest distance between two people. For us to be united, we should be seeking to be like Jesus, to be humble like he was. Think about it for a second. Here was the ruler of the universe, the commander of the world, and he put aside everything so that he could come and live as a humble peasant on this earth. Just think, for years, we don't know how many years, it may have been billions of years he lived in a place where there never was a bad word, there never was a swear word, there never was anybody who was upset or angry or, or uh, <coughs> pardon me, disengaged or, or was rebellious. And then he came and he lived in a place where his disciples would say, can anything good come out of that place? And friends, I want to put it to you that I believe the reason we do not yet see manifestations of God's power like in days of old are because we don't spend enough time petitioning his throne of grace for that power. God has not changed. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His might has not diminished, and his power has not dissipated. He is waiting for us daily to invite the Holy Spirit into our lives, to daily separate ourselves from sin, and in so doing, make room for the Holy Spirit to occupy our heart and our mind. I want to acknowledge the Holy, the latter rain is not a blanket power that is going to fall on everyone. We must be seeking it and praying for it ourselves. We must deny ourselves daily and be found much in prayer for the ground to be made ready for the rain. God's messenger for the last days has this to say about the latter rain. Many have in a great measure failed to receive the former rain. They have not obtained all the benefits that God has thus provided for him. When the richest abundance of grace shall be bestowed, they intend to open their hearts to receive it. They are making a terrible mistake. Every individual must realize his own necessity. The heart must be emptied of every defilement and cleansed for the indwelling of the spirit. It was by the confession and forsaking of sin, by earnest prayer and consecration of themselves to God, that the early disciples prepared for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. The same work only in greater degree must be done now. Review and Herald, March 2, 1987. I want to bring this message to a close and I want to leave just one question before you. This is not a question to upset or to cause any offense, but it's a question we must all answer. Am I hungering and thirsting after righteousness? Seeking daily for the precious drops to fall on me. Is there anything in my life that is blocking the rain, that is hindering the spirit? Any hidden or unconfessed sin? Any cherished habits or practices that are blocking the entry of God's grace? God's people at Waitara. I may never see you again because we don't know. But I want to leave this question with you. <clears throat> Are you ready for the rain? Is, has this become a daily practice in your life? The most important thing is not that you can rise up the corporate ladder, not that you can buy another investment property, not that you can buy that, that, that Merc or that Beamer or whatever. The daily practice of your life is for you to ask for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit so that you be separated from sin, so that it doesn't matter what time of day or night when your time is up, 
you are ready to meet Jesus. And when Jesus comes, and yes, he's coming sooner than we think. When Jesus comes in power and glory, then you will be amongst those that will be standing there calling out, this is our God, we have waited for him. You will be amongst those that will be elevated from this world. You'll be beating gravity. You won't be spending 500000 to fly in uh, <laughs> Richard Branson's jet or, or uh, Bezos or, or Elon Musk, whatever. They go up 50 miles and they think they've done such a great job. We're going to be traveling 50 billion of miles. I don't know how many. It won't be costing anything because God is coming to save us from a world that is dying. And let us confess our sins and petition his throne of grace and mercy. But you see, when he comes, all sin will be eradicated and death will be obliterated and God will finally be vindicated. Our redemption will be consummated and the devil will be extirpated and Jesus, our Savior, will be elevated. The faithful will be recreated and we will all be decorated in that coronation of the saints. You know, the only question I'm asking is, are you ready? If it were to happen now, would you be ready? I want to ask you, if you're not ready, do you want to stand and make a commitment to God today that he will come into your life and into your heart? Do you want to put aside all that worldliness that's, that's attracting you and all the, the uh, trivialities and all the ephemeral things for something that's eternal? Do you want to make a commitment to him? I'm not here to, to be able to say that I made an appeal and and 20 or 30 or 40 people stood up, friends, I'm not here to see, but God can see our hearts and our minds. He can read everything that we've ever done. He knows what we're doing, and he knows whether or not we're ready to meet him or not. So I'm asking if you know in your own heart and mind that you're not yet ready, that you want to commit yourself won't you please stand in commitment to him? You see, Jesus took a stand. He didn't just stay up in heaven and wave his magic wand over the world and uh, that was good enough. No, he came down to live on this earth because he wanted to save us from ourselves. Father, I thank you for your words. I thank you for blessing me with the words that you wanted Waitara to hear. And, oh, Father, help us all, wherever we are, to make ready, if we're not yet ready, to commit ourselves fully to you, to invite you into our lives day by day, to separate ourselves from the, the world and worldliness and be ready. This is my prayer, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.